It's my very, very great pleasure to welcome to you today, Professor Robert Burgoyne. Robert Burgoyne is a writer and lecturer, lecturer whose work centers on the theory and representation of history in film. He's the author of five books and numerous essays, and his work has been translated into nine languages. He's lectured in 13 countries and was formerly chair in film studies at the University of St. Andrews and professor of English and film studies at Wayne State University. He's currently working on a book length project on post 9-11 American war films, provisionally entitled The Body at Risk, War Cinema in the 21st Century. He's someone whose work is both theoretically dexterous and analytically innovative and always finds connections and establishes frame, frameworks that, to my mind, have the power to completely change one's way of viewing cinema, while suddenly also making complete sense in a way that no other reading can. To take just one example, his essay, The Violent Body, Affective Experience and Somatic Intensity in Zero Dark Thirty, entirely overturned what I thought the film was apparently obviously saying, revealing whole levels of meaning uh, that turned my own na naive belief that I was watching a gung-ho war on terror narrative into an understanding of the insecurities and uncertainties that lie at the film's heart, a reading that both enriched the dramatic character of the film, but also which opens up a very different horizon of political possibilities. Uh, to name just a few of his recent publications, uh, those include articles such as Post-Heroic War, The Body at Risk in Disappearing War, edited by Christina Helmick and Lisa Purse in 2018, and Forms of Time and the Chronotope in the Wall Street film in Global Finance on Screen, From Wall Street to Side Street, edited by Konstantin Pavelescu in the same year, as well as a reading of Dunkirk as an example of the battlefield gothic. He's told me that he has a couple of things in the pipeline at the moment which mark a bit of a departure with respect to his previous work, including an edited book entitled Refugees and Migrants in Contemporary Film, Art and Media to be published by Amsterdam University Press. So I very much look forward to seeing those. But most of all, please give a very warm welcome to Professor Robert Burgoyne. Thank you very much, Robert. Thank you, Lewis, and thank you for that lovely and, and generous and, and very touching introduction. Uh, and thank you for inviting me to give the talk uh, because this has given me to push forward some ideas, ideas, ideas for a bit. And I'm going to out, sort of go out on thin ice, I suppose. And here uh, in Michigan, we still have ice on the lakes, I believe, uh, because I'm going to talk about things that are a bit more theoretical than my work has been of late. Uh, more explicitly so, at least, let's put it that way. So, let me begin. They Shall Not Grow Old has been lavishly praised for its spectacular remediation of archival footage from World War I, its conversion of scratched, faded, and deteriorated, deteriorating celluloid into a digital pastiche of period-accurate colors, sounds, and lifelike movement. It has also been roundly criticized both for its exclusive focus on the Western Front depicting a fighting force consisting solely of white male British soldiers, as well as for its frequent imaginative interpolations of digital elements, including the substitution of background scenes and the painting in of colors that were invisible on the original film stock. These two critical objections apparently follow from, the, from very different premises. On the one hand, the film has been faulted for not representing the larger global story of World War I for being too narrow in its perspective. On the other, They Shall Not Grow Old has been criticized for being too imaginative, too free with its digital artistry. Both critical objections, however, stem from a similar perspective. Both see the film as falling short of the goal of accurately representing a past reality, a reality that is imagined to be preserved in all its testamentary force in the archives of the Imperial War Museum. In this presentation, I will attempt to frame They Shall Not Grow Old in a different way. Francesco Cassetti recently made a striking observation that I feel is a good starting place for analysis, commenting that once a camera is in an environment, the environment becomes cinematic. The presence of the camera on the battlefield and in the trenches, for example, changes the field itself. The World War I battlefield, he argues, ought to be thought of as a mediascape. In my view, Cassetti's observation offers a new way of approaching the textual work, They Shall Not Grow Old, performs 
on the archival films it treats. I will begin this presentation by summarizing the two lines of critical response I have adumbrated above and suggest that they are both based on a particular concept of the archive and its relation to historical representation. Both lines of critique assume that archival images are foundational, that they have primacy in terms of how we can accurately understand the past. The first objection, that the film is too limited in its orientation, concerns the fact that they shall not grow old, reinforces and preserves the dominant cultural memory of World War I in its most sacrosanct form. With its narrow focus on the fighting on the Western Front and its almost exclusive or concentration on white British soldiers, Jackson's film, the argument goes, simply brackets out the experience <coughs> of hundreds of thousands of colonial troops, Indian, African, and Chinese soldiers who contributed to the fighting on the Western Front and who fought in theaters of war around the world. Moreover, Jackson has all but eliminated the contributions of women to the war, whose role as nurses, munitions workers, cryptographers, truck drivers, and messengers has recently been the subject of extensive historical recovery. Jackson has said that he wished to paint a picture of war that would be universal, generic, and where the contributions of different races, ethnicities, and genders in different battlefronts could be subsumed into the one story. For Jackson, evidently, the universal representation of the Great War is crystallized in the image of the white British male soldier. Jackson, in the words of historian Santanu Das, thus erases the, the macabre cosmopolitanism of the trenches, end quote. The technical wizardry of the film, Das continues, was used to reinforce a narrative that had dominated and distorted our view of the war for decades. These non-white men and the extra European theaters were gradually airbrushed out of history as war memory crystallized around the Western Front in a skewed Eurocentric narrative of global conflict, end quote. He concludes by lamenting what he calls the wider sea of amnesia that still surrounds these islands of Eurocentric memory in popular culture. Doss's critique, echoed by several others, faults Jackson for not looking harder into the archives of the Imperial War Museum, the source for all the film's images, where ample visual material detailing the contributions of a wide population of colonial subjects, and where an abundant visual history of women's contributions to the war can be found. A much more representative history, which takes notice of the impressive new scholarship focusing on the global nature of the Great War and on the importance of highly skilled colonial troops to its success, could have been produced from the holdings of the museum. On the face of it, Das's argument is a if that the Imperial Museum has an extensive visual record of the efforts of colonial troops in World War I, as well as the contributions of women on the various war fronts and on the home front, his objections hit home. I am sympathetic to this line of criticism, but what I would like to highlight here is something else. The phrase airbrushed out of history, a phrase that reveals more than might be initially apparent. For one, it communicates an undertone of fear concerning visual media in relation to the past as if the referent itself, history itself, were now vulnerable to erasure. If we unpack the metaphor, it suggests that history itself has become a visual text, one that can be manipulated, altered, and partially erased. To airbrush out of history implies that the visual record and history are not only deeply entwined, but that they are coterminous. Despite his evident intentions, Das's metaphor of airbrushing, almost like a slip of the tongue that reveals an unconscious wish or belief, echoes the conjecture set forth by Cassetti that the battlefield should be thought of as a mediascape. The second line of critical objection that Peter Jackson, for all the research and care he gave the project, was too free and inventive with the digital transformation of the film, hinges on the question of what some feel are the proper limits of restoration. While the goals of restoration are generally understood as the attempt to bring the film to a condition that replicates the quality of the original release prints, with the rise of digital technology, that goal has sometimes been exceeded. 
As one archivist states, with digital technology, it is now possible to restore a film to image not only what the first spectators of the work saw, but what the cinematographer or camera operator saw as they were shooting the film. Jackson apparently endorses this view. They shall not grow old, he has said in interviews, conveys trench warfare in the colors and three dimensions that the soldiers themselves would have seen it. Some critics, however, feel differently. As Jan Christopher Horak writes about the argument of so many of many restoration specialists who claim that they are only doing what the original filmmakers would have tried if they had the tools available, quote, such efforts take a work out of history and into an ahistorical no man's land, end quote. <clears throat> and here I particularly appreciate that reference to no man's land, uh, given the topic uh, today. He continues, many of these changes, including 3D colorization, grain reduction, sharpening of the image, cropping the image, and conforming the, the film to sound speed, are a matter of public record and have been commented upon favorably. More troubling, given that Jackson is insisting on calling his film a restored documentary, is the outright falsification of images. Whole parts of images were removed and then repainted, e.g. in one scene houses were removed and replaced with green trees to make one composite more pleasing. According to David Walsh, head of restoration for the project, virtually every scene includes some redesigning of the actual image. The color compositing supervisor for the film, Russell McCoy, confides that, quote, there were giant holes where there would literally be frames missing, where we would have to rebuild them by recreating anything we had to or basically painting, end quote. And as Tanin Allison points out in a thorough and exemplary essay, the vibrant red blood covering dead or injured bodies and the colorful red, yellow, and blue wildflowers visible in many shots were almost certainly painted in additions that have little or no presence in the original footage. Modern day filmmakers become the ones in control of the archival image rather than relying on it to speak the truth of the past on its own." End quote. While I am sympathetic to both these arguments, they derive their authority from what I think is a limiting and somewhat questionable perspective, especially the digital intervention argument. The notion of archival materials as a type of testamentary document, the baseline for representation, the foundational and unerring truth of the past that predicates all later symbolic expression. As Allison writes, the filmmakers here chose to control the archival images rather than rely on the archive to speak the truth of the past on its own, end quote. But what if we consider they shall not grow old in a different light, not as representing a past reality, nor as restoring the images of the past, either more or less accurately, but as a form of quotation? What if we think of the film, not primarily in terms of original sources, which it embellishes or deviates from, but in terms of mimesis, not as portraying a past reality, but as producing a reality effect along the lines discussed by Roland Barthes. If we take Cassetti's suggestion that the presence of the camera changes the battlefield, that the field itself becomes cinematic, it may be possible to set to one side the ideal of historical veridiction as a property of the archive, and substitute instead the terms of textual analysis in reading the film, a move that opens a number of new perspectives. The work of Mieki Ball on quotation and painting is instructive. One of her fundamental points in quoting Caravaggio, preposterous history, is that quoting the past changes the past, or at least changes how we know it. The first sentence of her book puts it plainly, quote, Quoting Caravaggio changes his work forever, end quote. She continues, like any form of representation, art is inevitably engaged with what came before it, and that engagement is an active reworking. It specifies what and how our gaze sees. Hence, the work performed by later stages obliterates the older- The town we went through, people rushed it. Before that intervention, 
and creates new versions of old images instead." End quote. Ball's idea of quotation as an active reworking and as the obliteration of older images as they appeared in their earlier iterations provides a powerful description of Jackson's project in They Shall Not Grow Old. His recasting of archival images, adding color, three dimensions, smooth movement, and more, changes our ways of viewing the past. Moreover, the archival images Jackson worked with can no longer be seen as they were before. We must take the new intervention into account. There is more, however. The act of quotation of reframing does not simply obliterate older ways of seeing, it also brings the past into a dynamic dialogue with the present. As we view Jackson's work, the perspective of the present acquires a particular and useful salience. As Ball further writes, historians of art and literature have long been aware of the inevitable screen that later art puts in between the historian's gaze and the older works. But instead of considering this a problem, a liability of history, I have decided to explore this inevitability as an enrichment of our cultural habitat as a whole." End quote. In her view, the customary idea that the earlier, more ancient works of the past are primary and have a defining influence on the present should be It is the temporarily later quotations and appropriations of the works of the past that have primacy. What is chronologically first comes to us as an after effect of more recent, later work. This reversal of the sense of the pre and the post is captured in the subtitle of her work, Preposterous History. Reorienting, reorienting our approach to the past, and in particular to the archive, can have a salutary effect. As Ball writes, it makes historical art more important because it keeps it alive and does not isolate it in a remote past buried under concerns we do not share." End quote. Parts of this argument, of course, are already incorporated in certain genres of film critical practice. As Ian Christie argues in his review of They Shall Not Grow Old, the pseudo-technical criticism of the film is misguided. Lamenting commentary on the film that concentrates on things like the wrong colors for blood, flesh, and grass, he writes, few filmmakers consider archival material a sacred text. Instead, they treat it as a second nature, material traces of the past that are available for contemporary renegotiation, end quote. Christie cites various types of filmmaking, the compilation film, the found footage film, and the essay film as examples. We might add the videographic essay to this list of moving image works where archival footage is freely used as an artistic and critical resource. In the work of Ball, however, we find a theoretical argument that goes quite a bit further, asserting that the contemporary renegotiation of the traces of the past changes our understanding of the past, obliterating older images as they were beforehand. Her points go well beyond the critical discourse that has emerged around the videographic essay, the compilation film, or the essay film, raising both the theoretical and historical stakes of these forms of practice. Now moving on to part two here of the talk, which is uh, slightly less uh, based on the theoretical engagement with uh, the uh, archive. I would now like to look more closely at They Shall Not Grow Old, as an example of quotation in which the act of reframing the past, creating new versions of old images, gives them a particular relevance for the present. As one writer says, it is because discursive frameworks belong to the present and framing acts take place in the present that memory of the past, knowledge of history, can have consequences for our contemporary and future world." End quote. I will isolate two sequences from the film which are repeated multiple times. Sequences that immediately precede the harrowing full frontal assault that serves as the climax of the film. First, however, I'd like to provide some context for my reading and bring to the surface a theme that has not yet been discussed to my knowledge in the critical literature on the film. 
In a major interview with the BBC on the occasion of the premiere of They Shall Not Grow Old, Peter Jackson states that the narrative of World War I that has shaped cultural memory for over a century is misconceived, that it distorts the emotional coloration of the conflict and its aftermath, particularly in the case of British soldiers who fought on the Western Front. Far from embodying the stereotype of a lost generation stunned into silence by the extraordinary intensity and gruesomeness of prolonged trench combat, the soldiers whose voices we hear in They Shall Not Grow Old appear happy to recall their lives at war and in the trenches, which they narrate with a certain ebullience and zest. As Jackson says, there was a surprising lack of self-pity among the soldiers. Expanding on this point, he reflects, we look on these soldiers with a sense of pity now, but among them, there was no feeling sorry for themselves. Most had a positive view of their experience, like one big extended Boy Scout camp, end quote. He then qualifies his own disorienting counter narrative of the war, reminding us of the voices that it, we are not hearing, the voices of those who were killed, maimed, and horribly injured. They, quote, they probably wouldn't feel the same way. What we're getting are the voices of the survivors, end quote. What is even more surprising and somewhat troubling, however, is an entire register of war experience that seems to be missing from the film. Psychological trauma appears to almost be eliminated from the pictorial, auditory, and narrative frame. The bracketing of psychological injury is puzzling. A prominent motif in literature, film, and drama set in World War I, psychological trauma informs the cultural imaginary of the trenches in an explicit way. What Samuel Hines calls the battlefield gothic, the strange and uncanny appearance of the trenches and of no man's land, the constant din of bombardment, the inescapable smell of death, has made the trenches a privileged setting for the depiction of psychic wounding in war. Hines writes powerfully about the trenches and no man's land, emphasizing the psychological impact of living in a physical environment he describes as the death of landscape the annihilation of nature, and the monstrous appearance of anti-landscape. Dramatic fiction films, of course, are replete with examples of psychic trauma as a figure and a consequence of trench warfare, going back at least to Jacques and including such well-known works as The Big Parade, All Quiet on the Western Front, and Paths of Glory. And as psychological injury has increasingly come into relief as a defining feature of war, as cases of PTSD multiply in contemporary society, the visibility of psychic injury as a consequence of war's violence has also cast other representations of the past in a new light. The specter of psychological trauma during uh, World War I trench warfare is well documented. According to the BBC, by 1960, some 40% of soldiers suffered from some form of shell shock or war neurosis as it was also called, and some 80,000 men were treated for it. During the Battle of the Somme, which forms a major part of the image track of They Shall Not Grow Old, 16,000 of the men serving were thought to be victims of shell shock. The nearly complete absence of any direct reference to shell shock or war neurosis in the words of the interviewed veterans and in Jackson's commentary does not mean, however, that it has been wholly erased from the work. In certain scenes, I argue, psychic haunting is evoked not through explicit imagery or commentary, but rather intertextually in the memory of other films and photographs that the film summons. In other words, the vast intertextual universe of images of psychic trauma in representations of World War I and in depictions of other wars shapes our reading of specific scenes in the film. Miyake Ball's notion of preposterous history helps illuminate the particular historical and representational questions posed here. If we view They Shall Not Grow Old as a work of quotation rather than restoration, then our reading strategy changes as well. Intertextuality, heteroglossia, and interdiscursivity become valid, even necessary frames for reading the film interpretive frames that would not have been available if our focus had remained on the primacy of the archive. Moreover, as Ball insists, quotation 
changes the archival images upon which the film is based. The scratched, faded, black and white images in irregular speeds, when quoted in the present, emit different messages than they did before. Messages that are shaped and reoriented by an entire history of war film imagery. These scenes begin to signify in ways that link directly to the present. And one of the central themes of our present day reading of war cinema, whose history extends over the course of more than 100 years, is the tragic preponderance of psychological injury in war. Certain formal emphases function as cues or signals in the film. The nearly obsessive repetition of certain shots and images, the radical slowing down of the film, the direct address to the camera, almost as if the film were restaging a haunted return. Certain scenes are repeated again and again, rehearsed with an insistent, insistence that seems to call out for recognition. Scenes that speak to us, not so much as illustrations of the memories of the interviewees, now settled into late middle age or older, but rather through a different mode of expression. One shot of a group of men waiting to be ordered over the top, several looking directly into the camera, their faces filled with apprehension and anxiety, is returned to six times. Another shot depicting three soldiers turning to look over their shoulders toward the camera as they march through the trenches appears twice. In both sets of shots, the image track of the film slows down, arresting itself, at times appearing almost as slow, slow to freeze frame. For a film that had relentlessly striven to smooth out the speed of the archival footage, a technique that Jackson claimed made the soldiers come alive again, the sudden appearance of images that are slowed, halting, barely animated is striking. And here, Lewis, I would like you to show the first clip, if you would, and that should be clip number five. And this is the scene that I've just described. Okay, thanks. May take one moment to uh, do this, so just one second. Everybody just slumped away. We need the one previous to this. Oh, okay. That was listed as clip number five, but um, oh, sorry, then I, I yeah, that's okay. I, um, I've got it. Uh, of this. Right, just one second. So this one here with the gun. Yep. Okay. Um, right. I think I'll just need to reload the page. That might take a second. So you, you're your best friend, you look, you, you probably didn't know him the day before. And then an hour to go, there were, there were the longest and the shortest hours in life. We had unlimited time for thinking. And I know I found myself thinking much more deeply than I had ever thought before. Some people might be incapable of thinking. I might have regarded the situation as being such that they were incapable of thought. I don't think there was any feeling of fear. It was just that you know, we were doing a job and uh, if it came, it came. We realized that sooner or later, we were going to get the job. You were either going to be killed or wounded. I was not the least frightened of being killed, but I was terrified lest I should lose an arm or a leg. Waiting for an hour for an attack is not a very pleasant thing. We sort of uh, chattered away, trying to keep the spirit up, you see. We told dirty stories and made crude remarks. We had a thousand guns massed on a mile front behind us. Well, you imagine all this stuff coming over you. you know, the German stuff coming the other way. The noise rose to a crescendo such as I'd never heard before. You wouldn't hear any word. The shells were passing over you, probably three foot, four foot. And the air was an inferno. And your mind was another inferno. Reason was completely blasted out of it. The bombardment created a sort of hysterical feeling. All of a sudden, one of our fellows started crying, really screaming and crying. With the officer in charge telling the sergeant, Fire that man and shoot him, shoot him. 
it's difficult to explain the reaction of a man when he is in a big bombardment. He thought that his man's screaming and crying would be a danger to the rest of the men. As soon as it were light, we were given a ration of rum, any amount of it, which you can drink. And we've got the order to fix payments. It was a beautiful day the way it dawned after a rainy night. A beautiful day. And five minutes ago, I remember the first lads standing there. It's silent, couldn't make a noise. A more frightened city waiting to start. I was very frightened then, very frightened indeed. And an officer shouted along the line, is everybody ready? And I called out, I can't get my baby on my rifle, sir. And he said, damn you, mate, well, hurry up. I sent back a message to brigade headquarters saying we were all ready. But unfortunately, the slight mistake occurred. The first thing they knew was to rip Trevor on the ground. He's no alive. He should have been under the German trenches. It wasn't. There's a no man there. And that gave the Germans five minutes to occupy the crater, which they did. Sergeant Moore, he was standing behind the trench. He had a revolver in his hand, and he said, anybody goes back, I'll shoot him. So that if we didn't go one way, we wouldn't go the other. It wasn't a reluctance to go over the top of the people I were with. Fire! Fire! It would occur, shells over you, and you advanced. That was a theory of the thing. I realized that this was the moment of the assault. And then zero. Somebody shouted, there they go. To the left with the London Scottish running forward. That's good there. Yeah, thank you. And okay. So I'll I'll resume now. The repeated shot of men waiting to be ordered over the top is an the repeated shot of men waiting to be ordered over the top is, in my view, the unacknowledged center of the film, the place where the trauma of war is fully concentrated, forcing the spectator to see with all the indexical power that film can provide with the eyes of the soldiers who exist for this brief moment on the crease between life and death. The shot is repeated six times in the space of four minutes, emphasizing different soldiers in the group. With each repetition, the film speed slows finally arriving at a point where movement is almost stopped. Similarly, the close-up shot of the soldiers turning around to look at the camera as they march through the trenches is repeated twice. The first iteration of the looking back scene taken in medium shot at regular speed occurs before the fighting has commenced. Its second iteration is given just before the gruesome assault sequence begins. Here, the camera holds on the gaze of the soldiers in close-up as the film slows to a crawl. The shot echoes a strikingly similar pair of shots in All Quiet on the Western Front, where several soldiers turn one at a time to face the camera directly. In the first instance, they are about to embark on their first night patrol. In the second, at the very end of the film, they have each been killed. The background of the closing shot of the film is a dark graveyard. The soldiers are marching to their graves or perhaps marching from their graves to fight and die again. As Elizabeth Bronfen has it, the montage suspends the soldiers between life and death. They are neither fully gone nor fully returned. Yet with their gaze, they take possession of us, calling upon us to acknowledge an experience of war we share only by proxy in the darkness of the movie theater. Milestone's closure holds no redemption for us from their history. And now I'd like to show another clip, uh, Lewis, and this would be the uh, the clip from All Quiet. Okay, uh, the first one, the one that's obviously labeled number one. Well, uh, let's see if you can show me that list. That's, uh, yeah. yeah, there's the first one from All Quiet. Yeah, that's right. And then we'll, and then we'll go to the second one immediately after. Ride you gave a good killer's nothing worth. Be on time. I don't want to miss my breakfast. And we'll go through that 
second clip from All Quiet. These charged moments of direct address in They Shall Not Grow Old, in which natural lifelike movement is sacrificed for the, for the symbolic power of extreme slow motion, have a different sense and meaning than the many shots of soldiers mugging or staring into the camera in the film. Here, at a point of mortal reckoning, the figures look into the camera and communicate a very different set of emotions. The fraught nature of these looks recalls the long photographic tradition of images of soldiers stunned by fear and the sense of imminent death. They recall as well the many cinematic representations of psychic distress in films of war, where direct address to the camera has become almost a signature trope of the genre. Examples of prolonged direct address at moments of crisis can be found in films such as Apocalypse Now, Saving Private Ryan, Flags of Our Fathers and others. And here I'd like uh, to show the clip, the three clips in succession, Lewis, Apocalypse, Saving Private Ryan, and Flags of Our Fathers. In this war, things get confused out there. Power, ideals, the old morality, and practical military necessity. But out there with these natives, it must be a Temptation to be God. Because there's a conflict in every human heart between the rational and the irrational, between good and evil. And good does not always triumph. Sometimes the dark side overcomes what Lincoln called the better angels of our nature. Every man has got a breaking point. You and I have. Walt Kurtz has reached his. And very obviously he has gone insane. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Very much so, sir. Obviously insane. Your mission is to proceed up the Nung River in a Navy patrol boat. <clears throat> All right, and Lewis, we can move on now to this uh, next clip, which is Saving Private Ryan.
And that is uh, that is it for the clips. Thank you, Lewis. That helped. I'm now going to uh, move to the conclusion of my uh, my talk. In this talk, I have argued that the reframing of the past that they shall not grow old conducts on multiple levels, including the interpolation of digital elements, the addition of color, widescreen, and 3D, need not be seen as an ahistorical substitution of a modern way of seeing for an older mode of historical representation, but as something else entirely. If we view the work as a quotation, rather than as a questionable restoration, the film can be understood through multiple frameworks that enrich perception rather than narrowing to the single lens of fidelity, of its fidelity or not to the past. By focusing on the film as a textual system, we can view its additions and enhancements in terms of mimesis rather than recovery, in terms of the creation of a reality effect rather than its adherence to the real. Where the work was at first surprising and challenging for me, however, was in its apparent bracketing out of the experience of psychic injury, its seeming elision of shell shock from the narrative it presents. The experience and the reality of psychopathology, so prominent in the dominant narrative of World War I, appears to be elided from representation in the film. It was this surprising absence that spurred me to consider a different way of reading the work, not as a bravura digital remediation or as a brazen flouting of the codes and ethics of restoration, but rather through the relays its images establish with other films and photographs. Here, Ball's idea of preposterous history provided a way in. If the work that comes chronologically after reshapes the work that came before, if it changes the work forever, as Ball writes, the film can be read not as a modern distortion, but rather as a rethinking, making visible theoretical and historical issues that can only be perceived through what she calls the detour of the present. It is this insight that I have tried to address in my reading of the film. They Shall Not Grow Old may be seen as an act of reframing in depth, almost like a form of image stacking or focus stacking in photography, 
where multiple shots are superimposed in order to filter out the visual noise and to allow the signal to come through more strongly. In the repeated scenes of direct address to the camera, in the slowing down of critical sequences just before the major battle scene, in the powerful repeated close-ups that Jackson employs almost as interpolations of the spectator, we come to see an entire history of war representation, a history that brings together documentary and dramatic fiction film, still photography and moving images to provide a sharpened image of soldiers at a psychological tipping point. The film quite unexpectedly moves us away from the idea of the archive as a sacred repository. The newer work brings certain sing signals into relief that are comprehensible to us now in a way that may not have been apparent in the original images. Rather than a recovery of a buried past, the film makes vis visible through the detour of the present, a sense of what images of World War I can mean in today's war-saturated image culture. The history of that past is no longer isolated and buried under concerns we do not share, and that's Mieke Paul, but joined to a vital and developing lexicon of war representations, where psychic injury has assumed an increasingly prominent role. The film finally provides a kind of object lesson in the way we approach the historical past, reminding us that history, for all of its significance in our culture, cannot speak for itself, that it has no mouthpiece of its own. It can speak only through interpretation and symbolic expression. And that concludes my, my uh, talk. Thank you.